Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to maybe the first chapter of the book of Romans. First chapter of the book of Romans. As I mentioned uh, last time I was here, I uh, was planning on uh, doing a series of messages from the book of Romans. So uh, starting that this today, I'm not going to cover everything in Romans in this sermon series. I've already done some uh, chapters in this from this book and sermons in the past, but we're definitely going to do look at uh, much of chapter one, the first seven verses today. So Romans chapter one, starting at verse one. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless this portion of the word. Bless this message. Speak through this message to us all. Encourage us and strengthen us. Use this word to impart knowledge that we need. And for grace that's so needed in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome. This was not a church that he had visited. Uh, Bible scholars believe this church probably started sometime after Pentecost. Probably people being converted in the early days of the church and lived in Rome and then they went to Rome and started a church there. Whatever the case is, Paul is writing to this group. Uh, it mentions that he hopes to visit them. Romans is about the gospel plain and simple. We even see that in the first chapter, particularly these verses that I'm going to be speaking on today. And throughout the whole book, the book of Romans is about the gospel. Now, we see that Paul identifies himself, first of all, as a servant of Jesus Christ. And when we're talking about servant, we're not talking about our modern concept of servants. Like the person in, what was that show, uh, Downton Abbey, where we was, servants in tuxedos and women in long black dresses. That's not the concept that Paul's talking about. The word servant means bond servant or slave. The apostle is identifying himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, because of the neg negative connotation that we here in America have towards slavery, it's hard for us to grasp this. But what the apostle was identifying himself is not so much a slave that would be beaten with whips, with, uh, whips and all, but what he was identifying himself as, as, he was identifying himself as a love slave, a love slave to Jesus Christ. One that was, yes, a slave, but he was a slave out of love for the Lord. Now, in the book of Exodus, we see that when a slave served his term, his master was obligated to set him free, but if the slave wanted to continue on, he would have to have a nail, an awl, drilled through his ear alongside the door, and that was a symbol that he wanted to be a love slave for his master. And that's what Paul was 
That's what we should be, love slaves for the Lord Jesus Christ. We, like Paul, belong to Christ. We are his possessions under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Having been redeemed from our sinful lifestyle to serve God instead. As slaves to Christ, we are not our own. Uh, you may want to turn to, to Romans 14. And basically, this scripture, this scripture pretty much defines what I've been talking about up to now. It basically tells us who we should, why we're saved, and who we should be living for. Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 7. For none of us live to himself, and no man die to himself. Wherever we live, we live unto the Lord. Wherever we die, we die unto the Lord. Wherever we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. As citizens of God's kingdom, we have responsibilities before God. And we also have blessings from him as well. Now the next thing we need to look at is that Paul identifies himself as an apostle. And the word apostle means sent one. A messenger sent. Somebody sent on a mission. And Paul was summoned to be such an apostle for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was placed in that position by God himself. He knew that he was not called by man to be an apostle. Now we have quite a number of ministers here in Rockingham County that are man-called ministers. God has no part in their calling. They call themselves, or some of them, or, by, or maybe their parents called them, or somebody else called them. But God did not call them. We got a lot of those people around. But the Apostle Paul surely was called by God. And the Church of Jesus Christ has an apostolic mission. And that includes this group here at Hilltop. We have an apostolic mission. We are sent by God to live and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. All local Bible-believing churches have an apostolic commission to be presenters of the gospel in the areas that they serve them. Uh, Paul also mentions in verse 1 that he is separated unto the gospel of God. Separated means to be marked up by batteries, to be set apart for a purpose. And in this case, in Paul's case, it's the gospel of God. The gospel is the good news of God. It comes from God. It's about God who is revealed in the gospels through Jesus the Son. Now, Paul was definitely separated into the gospel of God. And all believers are separated to the gospel. Now, not in the same sense that Paul was or some other people, but they're definitely separated to the gospel. When one is dedicated to the gospel, he or she will be dedicated to the active presentation of the gospel. He will personally or by praying, or by proxy. And what I mean by proxy, a good example is the missionaries that we support. Now, none of us that I'm aware of has been to Taiwan. But we help support a missionary couple that's in Taiwan. The Cubs. And they're supposed to be coming to back to the States this spring. We, by proxy, are helping Numerous missionaries carried the gospel to the lands that they've been sent to. If one is in business, his or her business should be dedicated to the gospel. I thank God for those businessmen that I've met whose businesses have definitely been dedicated to the gospel and their business practices reflect the word of God. 
Our money must be dedicated to the gospel. Our time, our effort should be dedicated to the gospel. Now we see in verse 2 that the gospel was not something new in Paul's time. Rather, it was prophesied of in the Old Testament. The prophets in the Old Testament prophesied about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, prophesied about his death and resurrection, prophesied about the message, prophesied about the coming of the Holy Spirit. We see the prophets include Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and a lot of what we call the minor prophets, Jonah, Nahum, and so on. The, the Old Testament in its entirety looked to the new, and the New Testament is a fulfillment of the old. One noted author said Christianity actually started when God encountered Abraham and called him to follow him. Way back in Abraham is really when Christianity started. And of course, Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God when he came the first time. Okay, and of course, the gospel is about Jesus. One commentator mentioned that Paul names Jesus four times in these first seven verses. This leaves no doubt that God's Son is not merely the founder of the gospel, but he is the gospel. But take a look at the word Christianity. Take the word Christ out of it. What do you got? You don't have much of any word. You take Christ out of Christianity, and all you got is a social order. Jesus is what makes Christianity Christianity. Jesus is what the gospel is about. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in verse 3, what we see is our Lord's humanity in this verse. The term was made speaks of an entrance into a new condition. He became a man. John 1 14. And the word became flesh. Now we've seen John 1 1 that the word was God. So the word who was God, who we know to be Jesus, became flesh over 2,000 years ago. Jesus entered to a new state by assuming a human body and putting himself under human limitations. The word flesh here means human body, not the unredeemed nature of mankind. And of course, our Lord coming to the earth was a virgin birth. The Holy Spirit conceived him in the womb of a virgin. He had a human flesh, but he did not have the sinful nature. That he was of the seed of David, as we see in verse 3, means that he was of the lineage of David. And the Old Testament made it very clear that the Messiah was to come out of the lineage of David. And Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. Now we see that he was declared to be the Son of God with power. Declared means to mark out the boundaries or limits. Although Jesus was the Son of God before he came on the earth, the resurrection proved that he was not just another man, but different. He was the God-man. The resurrection is both God's approval of Jesus and the vindication of his claims, his claim to be God's Son. And this declaration that we see in verse 4 was done in power. God's power which raised Jesus from the dead. You may want to turn to Romans 8. There's a verse I want to read there. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 11. 
Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. But the Holy Spirit that's in us, praise God, was involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we have been made alive in Christ through the Holy Spirit. This power that I'm talking about in verse 4 was done by what is the Spirit of Holiness, which is another term for the Holy Spirit. Now we see in verse 5 that Paul talks about how he received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. For his name. I don't want to say something to us here today. Through Jesus, we have received grace. Grace is unmerited faith. We have a grace that saves us from our sins. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Turn to made in Romans chapter 3. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, we see this. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Every one of us that born to be born again have been declared not guilty of past sin. How? By the grace of God, this justification came free, not by works. It was done through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. That is, he died on the cross for our sins, paying the penalty that we owe because of our disobedience. We have a grace that sustains us in this present time, that it enables us to live for God. The Apostle Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, when he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You are the believer that you are through the grace of God. And this grace teaches us. Turn if you may to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verse 11. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For well, the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldliness, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So we've been taught by the grace of God to live righteous, godly lives. <clears throat> we have grace for obedience. I should point out that we have been saved to obey God. 1 Peter chapter 1 has a verse I want to bring to your attention. 1 Peter chapter 1. I've been doing quite a bit of reading in 1 Peter and 2 Peter lately. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, the scripture says, Talking about believers, elect according to the full knowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. We have been saved to obey. Obey who? God. We have been saved to walk in obedience to the Almighty. It is the fruit of the faith that we have in Jesus. Now, this faith we all have. Regardless of how long one saved, is the faith once and for all delivered to the saints that Jew talks about in his book. Every single born again believer throughout this entire planet has the same faith in this sense. We have faith in Christ. There is no other faith. There are plenty of false faiths, but there's only one true faith. 
faith in Jesus. And every believer, whether they got saved this morning, or whether they've been saved over 50 years, has the one faith, faith in Jesus Christ. And this faith is, has been and is to be spread to all the nations. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said in Matthew chapter 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And there's a scripture I want to point out in Luke chapter 24. Jesus spoke this as well. Actually, all four Gospels have a great commission. That is Luke's great commission, as Jesus said. 20, Luke 24, verse 47. Luke 24, verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This is in view of all that Jesus is in his power and honor and recognition of all that he is and for his sake. We are called as a church of Jesus Christ to call the world to obedience to God through faith in Jesus. And of course, the scripture talks about the believers being the called of Jesus Christ. Now, what that is saying is, keep in mind, everybody that knows Christ has heard the call of God through the presentation of the gospel. Whether they got the gospel of church service, whether they got the gospel of the crusade, whether they heard the gospel on the radio, whether they read it in the, read it in the scriptures, whether they got it through a track, or personal witness from somebody when they got the gospel they heard the call of God and those that believe on Jesus Christ all be called of God they are the called of Jesus Christ every one of you in here that born again every one of you that's going to see this on video that knows Jesus Christ you are the called of God you've been called out of this world to serve God to love him and to follow Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, when talking to the church in Rome, called him beloved of God. Beloved of God. Keep in mind that every believer in Jesus Christ is loved of God. Everybody that's part of Hilltop Bible Church is loved of God. You that see this on video that know Jesus is loved of God. And we're called to be saints. Every believer is a saint. Did you know that? Now the Roman Catholic Church only recognizes certain people as saints. But the Bible calls all of us that know Jesus saints. That means that we're set apart from the world and set apart to God. We have saints right here in your type Bible church. So in closing, we have been called into a gospel, a gospel that's of Jesus Christ. It is a gospel that's been confirmed by the power of God through Jesus rising from the dead. It is a gospel that must be spread throughout the entire planet and we have a role to play in that. It is a gospel that called us to serve God and we who know God are called of God. And the apostle gives his salutation he gives him throughout just about all the churches of life, like to grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us in here need grace and peace each and every day. And those of us that believe on Jesus have 
the grace of God and the peace of God in our lives. And with that, I close. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the word. May our hearts be encouraged. May our faith be strengthened. Definitely encourage those of us to see this on video. Save any of those that see this on video, but don't throw me. In Christ's name, amen.